Dr. Kim uh, went to Vanguard University, went to Westminster Seminary, went to Ted's uh, uh, Trinity in Chicago where he got his doctorate. He's a, he's a scholar in uh, English uh, Reformation history. Uh, but he spent most of his time teaching uh, practical theology, preaching, New Testament, about everything. He is uh, he's a pastor to pastors. Dean of Students at Westminster Seminary in California, Escondido, California, where he's also an associate pastor. He serves uh, as a missionary, and I'll let him tell you uh, where he serves. I'm not sure it's appropriate to say it publicly because it's in dangerous places. All of that is to say he is a man who has completely surrendered to the kingdom of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ and uh, gives himself gladly for uh, that cause, extending the kingdom of God to the ends of the earth. Let me, uh, before he comes, read to you uh, what he says fires him up every day and what you will hear in his lectures this morning. As a professor, my hope and prayer is that my students would take the Apostle Paul's words to heart when he said, However, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given to me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Would you come remind us of that grace and teach us how to preach it more clearly? Introductions are always very awkward <laughs> in so many ways. Um, thank you, George. It's uh, Dr. Robertson. Thank you uh, for that very kind and warm welcome. Thank you also to Mike and John and other pastors here uh, for your hospitality and your help in uh, getting me here, and et cetera. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, George, has it really been 20 years since we served together on that board, which is amazing uh, because George and I... Let's see, that would, put, that would make me, what, 63 now, or? Yeah, exactly. yeah as an Asian, uh, I don't know if you know that, uh, but uh, I am actually 75. Uh, but you just don't recognize that, uh, no, no, but uh, I'm inscrutable Asian, so. Thank you, thank you for this uh, opportunity to bring God's word to you. If you have your Bibles, I'd like to begin our first uh, discussion, and I, and I mean that discussion. I, I don't know many of you. In fact, I think I only know one of you in this room. I know, I'm getting to know a few of you more. Uh, so I don't know your background. I don't know your tradition. I don't know your training, your experiences, your history. And so I'm kind of flying here by the seat of my pants in terms of uh, what you already know, what you want to know, and what I need to know, and what I'm still learning. And so I hope that through our conversation together, I'll share a few things of what I've learned and what I've uh, uh, studied and then hopefully you'll share with me uh, what you think of that. And so I hope uh, this will be a profitable time for you as we examine this notion of preaching Christ from all the scriptures. Uh, that's what we'll be talking about for today. Uh, this, this idea that Christ is present in all the scriptures and thus we need to interpret, read, study, and in fact preach, teach, and live according to the reality that the Bible is essentially about one person that he's the primary character of all of scripture. Because my presupposition is that there's one primary author, namely God himself, who used various men through various times and various cultures, histories, geography, and even time, but essentially composed one message, one story, one grand narrative, but told throughout time and space. And so in light of that, I wanna, I wanna talk today first uh, about the why. Why preach Christ from all the scriptures? Perhaps you don't agree with that, and that's fine. And so what I want to do is, is give you three reasons why I think we want to read, read from scripture and then interpret scripture, then essentially preach and teach from all the scriptures, Jesus himself. So I'd like to begin by reading from Luke chapter 24. It's a seminal passage. Luke chapter 24 In this last chapter of Luke, we find Jesus post-resurrection meeting two discouraged disciples on the road to Emmaus. Many of you may know the story. Starting in verse 13, we find Jesus appearing 
uh, to these two discouraged disciples who were followers of Jesus, but then were very discouraged because this leader, their rabbi, their teacher, died. And so they, they walk from Jerusalem to Emmaus, which is about a seven-mile journey. And along this way, Jesus begins to teach them from all the scriptures, which for him, of course, was the Hebrew Bible. The New Testament did not exist at the time. So Jesus, using the Old Testament, what we would consider the Old Testament, or the Hebrew Bible, begins to unfold and unravel the greatest Bible story ever told. And this is what we read, starting in verse 13. 24, 13. This is the word of God. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. As they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened, while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing them. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, still looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying, that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it was just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther, but he urged them strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Verse 36. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them, that is the disciples, and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they, they, were, they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still, while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. Now listen carefully here. And then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Thus far the reading of God's word. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this opportunity to come before you. We humble ourselves, seeking the power of your spirit to understand your words, not only in our minds, 
but also in our hearts and especially in our lives. Thank you for every single person in this room that desires to know you more and make you known. Father, we ask for your blessing. Thank you for your promise that when we seek you, you come to us. So draw near to us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Preaching Christ from all the scriptures seems so obvious. In fact, if I were to take a survey of this room and ask every single one of you, do you believe that we ought to preach Christ from all the scriptures? I would like to believe that every single one of you would say, absolutely, yes. But what does that actually mean, and what does that actually look like? For some people, preaching Christ, especially for preachers in this room, it means doing justice to the text, let's say from the Old Testament. And that means preaching the text as it is given and spending the 30, 40, 50, maybe 60 minutes preaching the text as it was given by the original author to the original audience and deriving from it meaning and purpose for our lives today. But then spending the last five minutes of the sermon, and by the way, believe in Jesus, because without Jesus you have no hope. Is that preaching Christ from all the scriptures? There may be others who believe that preaching Christ is basically trying to find Christ under every rock and every snake, from every river and every mountain found in the Bible. And so everything in the Bible is about Jesus. And if everything is about Jesus, then it seems like nothing is about Jesus because then you're not preaching the actual text. So how, what does it mean to preach Christ from all the scripture? Further making the issue more challenging, not all preachers are even convinced that preaching Christ from all the scriptures that is, that is something that should be done in every sermon, which is my contention. What does it mean to preach Christ from all the scripture? And so what I'd like to do today is prov provide for you or present to you at least three reasons why I believe we ought to read the scriptures, interpret the scriptures, in order to preach and teach the scriptures in light of Christ. Three reasons why. Because it's biblical, first. Secondly, because it's foundational. And then lastly, because it's practical. Biblical, foundational, and practical. So let's, let's take a look at that. First, preaching Christ is biblical. I believe one of the most compelling reasons why readers of Scripture and preachers of Scripture should interpret and preach Christ from all the Scriptures is simply because Jesus himself did it, as well as the apostles. Even a cursory look at the evidence in the New Testament demonstrates that Jesus and his disciples interpreted the scriptures, which again, for them, was the Hebrew Bible, what we call today the Old Testament as Christians. They didn't have the New Testament then, but Jesus and his apostles interpreted and preached the Bible, that is the Old Testament, according to the person and work of Jesus Christ, the Messiah King. And as such, they modeled a particular pattern to follow, follow, not only in terms of interpretation, but also, I believe, in communication. Early Christian preaching, as, mo as modeled by Jesus and the apostles, had, I believe, a central controlling message and a specific gospel or evangelistic purpose. Early gospel preaching, as done by Jesus and the apostles, had this central controlling message and specific evangelistic or gospel purpose purpose. Simply to take the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, he said, for I delivered to you as of first importance what was for him the priority, what he is called to do, what I also received. This is the Apostle Paul. And what is that message? That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. The Apostle Peter states with the same force. He says this in Acts chapter 4, verses 10 through 12. Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. These two great apostles of the New Testament, arguably the pillars of the church today, Paul and Peter, spoke with unanimity regarding their own message and their purpose as the apostles of the Christian church. This message and purpose, however, did not originate with them. 
They learned it from their teacher, their rabbi, Jesus. Here in Luke chapter 24, this chapter that we just read, or the section that we read, a story is recorded for us by the gospel writer Luke that I think forever changes the way readers, interpreters, preachers, and teachers look at the Bible, especially the central message of the Bible and the specific purpose of the Bible. In Luke 24, Luke describes the risen Jesus appearing to these disciples. What confused these disciples, what discouraged them, in fact, in fact, in fact depressed them, was they couldn't put together all that had happened three days before and in all the life and teaching of Jesus that was given to them. But to the shock of these disciples, Jesus said, to this, said this to them in verses 25 to 27, O oh, foolish ones, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. He says, was it not necessary, Jesus said, that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And then he uses this category, he says, and beginning with Luke records this, and beginning with Moses and the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures concerning himself. Now keep that in mind. Luke says it beginning with Moses and the prophets. And then later, if you skip down to verse 44, Jesus himself uses this kind of designation regarding the Bible. He says, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. There's a whiteboard here, but there's no marker I don't see. We'll just pretend I'm writing something on the board. Oh, the man of the hour. <laughs> and so Jesus uses these two designations. Luke first says the law of Moses, right? And the prophets, okay? In Jewish synagogue worship, when you go to a Jewish synagogue ceremony or, or worship service, there's always two readings of scripture that have been set for centuries by the rabbis. There's always a reading from the law, the Torah, what we'd call the first five books of the Bible, and there's a reading from the prophets. Jesus now uses, this is, what, this is the designation Luke uses to basically say all the Bible, or that was present at the time, which is the Old Testament. Jesus says the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. Very interesting designation. Jesus uses this designation, which in the Hebrew would be the Torah, the Nevi'im, or the prophets, and the Kuthuvim, which literally means the writings. The Hebrew Bible is not, uh, the, if you go to the, uh, what is that, the, not the directory, but the table of contents. If you go to the table of contents of a Hebrew Bible even today, you go to a Jewish synagogue, you go to a, uh, and grab a Hebrew Bible, it would not be in the same order as our Old Testament. They place it in this order first. The first five books would be similar to ours, the Torah, first five books of Moses. Then the Nevi'im refers to all the prophets, as they would call it, starting with Joshua to the minor prophets. Then everything that doesn't fit that category of prophecy, they call the writings. And the writings begin, guess what, with, with what book? The Psalms. And so, in the, and then if you look at the cover of the Hebrew Bible, guess what, guess what three letters are on the Hebrew Bible? TNK. And so this is, this is the designation that was used at Jesus' day, even to this day, the Tanakh is the entire Hebrew Bible. In, in, in Jewish worship services, there's always two readings. The primary reading, which is from the law, and the secondary reading, which is from the prophets. These were the two ways of essentially describing the entire Bible at, as it was collected at that time. The New Testament doesn't come, become collected until about the fourth century, when all the letters are being passed around. But the Old Testament has already been collected together by the Jews, and that was called the Tanakh. So Jesus says here, to the shock of these disciples, and hopefully a shock to us, that these are the things written about me in all the Old Testament. What is that? That Christ should suffer and die and raise and be raised for, this, for our sins. So basically, the gospel message, in order to save and sanctify people, is what the whole Bible is about. You see what Jesus is saying? Jesus is giving us this paradigm of understanding what the Bible is centrally about. Not only the central message, Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, but also his gospel purpose, so that men and women and children would come to faith in him.
and be changed forever. So Jesus is saying that the reason why you read scripture and preach scripture according to Christ is because the whole Bible is about me. You see, Jesus is the only one who can be that selfish and that self-centered and not be sinful. Seeing the whole Bible, I'm sorry guys, but it's really about me. But I actually, this message changes lives. It has a central controlling message and specific gospel purpose. This is what Jesus is saying. And this is what he taught Peter and Paul and all these other disciples. Let me take you to another passage of scripture that is also very interesting. Jesus not only teaches his apostles the central controlling message and the specific gospel purpose, but he actually exemplifies it. Turn with me to John chapter 6. In John chapter 6, the gospel writer John records for us an early, can I call it, Christ-centered sermon of Jesus. Remember, this is prior to his death and resurrection. But even prior to his death and resurrection, Jesus is beginning to model for us how to read the scriptures, how to interpret the scriptures, and then how to preach it in light of the person and work of Jesus. And he does it here. In John chapter 6, we don't have time to read it, but in verses 25 to 59, we actually have an abridged, shortened, abbreviated version of Jesus' sermon. We, call, we usually call it in our Bibles the bread of life discourse, I think it's called. So this is right after the feeding, the miraculous feeding of the 5,000, which is a great introduction to a sermon, by the way. <laughs> Look, I just fed 5,000 people. That pays attention. People pay attention to an intro like that. Now let me tell you what all this is about. And he begins to explain to the folks that have been gathered what it means, this bread coming from heaven. And notice with me uh, what Jesus does here. Jesus begins to preach a sermon. I believe it's a sermon based on the structure and what he actually says. You see, during Jesus' day, the common way of preaching in Jewish synagogues would follow this pattern of reading from the law and then reading from the secondary reading, the prophets. That is, in a Jewish synagogue service, if you would go to, if you would go to a synagogue, uh, participate in their service, the rabbi would always have two readings that they would have and then explain from them. Are you following me so far? You, you kind of remember this in Luke chapter 4. Remember Jesus goes to the temple and, and, and the reading for that day was Isaiah 61. And crazily he says, today the scriptures have been fulfilled in your hearing. What he is doing, he's going to the temple, he's going to the synagogue and reading what was presented. Providentially, it was Isaiah 61 at that time. What he does here is he now takes that same pattern, a synagogue worship, rabbi homily pattern, a pattern that even today Jewish rabbi preachers follow. They follow what's called a, a lectionary or a church calendar of, of pre-selected readings, and then they preach from that. Jesus uses that model. That's why we know it's a sermon. He uses this Jewish uh, preaching model and structure, but he infuses whole new meaning. So while the form of the sermon would have been very familiar to those listening, the interpretation would have been shocking. Take, take a look, for example, in John 6, 31, you see the primary text there is Exodus 16, 4. So he quotes Exodus 16, 4, talking about bread that came to Israel. Remember the miraculous bread of manna that came for the, for the Israelites during their wilderness wanderings. And so that's the primary reading. That's the first reading from the law, from the Torah. And then he begins to explain what this meant for Israel, that God provided for them, that God was faithful, that when they were in need and they were hungry, not only physically, but ultimately it meant spiritual hunger, God feeds them. And then he actually interprets that and says, I am that bread from heaven. So he interprets Exodus 16, not only in light of what it meant for Israel in their day, but what it means for his disciples listening to him in his day, which then has implications for our day and the way we read Exodus 16. Do you see? This bread that came from heaven, this manna that was provided by God, fed the Israelites, thereby nurturing not only their bodies, but ultimately their souls, so they would continue to trust in the Lord. And now he says, guess what? 
that was just a shadow or what we would call a type of something greater that is to come. And he interprets using a, a model of interpretation called typology, where you have a, a, an event or a symbol that has analogical meaning and escalation, I'll explain this more in just a little bit, to Jesus. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I'm the one that came from heaven. And then he says, again, let me, let me apply this for you. You must eat of me. The Pharisees thought he was crazy. What kind of cannibalistic crazy man is this? They had no idea of what was to come, namely his death and resurrection. And ultimately, even the Lord's Supper, right? So this is Jesus' way of interpreting Exodus 16. But wait, that's not all. This is like a great infomercial. But wait, that's not all. <laughs> if you listen more, I've got more. Then he, then he points to a secondary reading from Isaiah 54, 13, right? It's in John 6, 45. He uses the secondary text, which would have been familiar. Okay, Jesus, Rabbi, you just taught us from the Torah, now teach us from the prophets. And then he quotes from Isaiah 54, 13, there in John 6, 45. And then he says, how can I say this? And then he declares to them, because I am God. The one teaching you right now is God himself. Because only God can come and feed you with the bread of life. And once you eat of me, that is, once you believe in me, you will never go hungry again. So he places eternal, Christocentric meaning upon this. Again, you've got to think how shocking this would have been to these early Jewish disciples that were, that were familiar with the pattern, familiar with the form of the sermon, but then he interprets it this way. Crazy, crazy, crazy talk. This is the same God who not only fed the Israelites during the wilderness wanderings, this is the same God who feeds this 5,000 with five loaves of bread and two fish. Now I will ultimately feed you eternally, ultimately pointing forward to his death and resurrection. That those who feed on him spiritually will receive eternal life. Central controlling message, Jesus Christ, the gospel for a specific evangelistic purpose, so that you would have faith and trust in him in your life. Something has happened that will change your life. That's what Jesus is now modeling in his preaching. So this is what the apostles learned from Jesus. So let's take quickly a look at the apostles and what they did. I'll take you to two passages to give you an example of how the apostles then followed this pattern of interpretation and communication. The preaching of the apostles. Uh, first, uh, let me just say that the, if, you, if you even do a cursory study of the sermons of the apostles found in the New Testament, several kind of themes emerge and, 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 and help us understand what they're trying to do. Essentially, my argument here is that the heart of apostolic preaching as presented in the New Testament was Jesus Christ. The heart of apostolic preaching was Jesus. Take, for example the multiple Greek verbs that are used for preaching. There are many Greek words, uh, Greek words in the New Testament for the word preaching or to preach, to witness, to teach, to evangelize, to proclaim. What's interesting is if you do a word study of every one of those Greek verbs and look at its direct object, namely, what are they preaching? What are the apostles teaching? What are the apostles witnessing about? Are you following me? So verb, direct object. These are all the direct objects of the apostolic preaching and teaching. Ready? Here are all, the, all of them. This took me a long time, so take, pay, pay, pay careful attention. All right? The direct object of all the words, Greek words for preaching. Ready? Jesus, Lord Jesus, Christ, Christ Jesus as Lord, Christ crucified, Christ as raised from the dead, Jesus and the resurrection, good news about the kingdom, Jesus as the Son of God, the gospel, the gospel of God, the gospel of Christ, the gospel of peace, the word of the Lord, the forgiveness of sins, the unsearchable riches of Christ, and Christ in you, the hope of glory. Any commonalities at all? <laughs> you don't need to be a biblical scholar to see that there's a common theme to the direct objects, to all the New Testament words that refer or are translated in our Bibles as preaching, teaching, proclaiming, etc., witnessing. 
as the, objects, as, the, as the objects of these verbs demonstrate, there is no doubt that Christ was the heart of apostolic preaching. Let me give you two examples really quick. In Peter, Peter in Acts chapter 2, one of the earliest recorded Christian sermons we have post-death and resurrection. So Jesus has died, he's been raised, he's ascended into heaven, and now the apostles are called upon to preach. Preach Jesus. How do they do it? Acts chapter 2 you have the gift, you have Pentecost, right? It's the, it's the Feast of Pentecost in Jerusalem. The gift of the Holy Spirit comes, and people, the disciples, the followers of Jesus, begin to speak in all various languages. Not just in English, but also in Korean maybe, I don't know. But we have them speaking in a variety of different languages, testifying and honoring and glorifying God. And then Peter stands up to speak to explain this phenomenon of people speaking and glorifying God and testifying to the gospel in various languages that they did not even know. And again, he begins with this great introduction. What a great introduction to a sermon. These men are not drunk. I want, one of these days, George, I want to start a sermon like that. I am not drunk. <laughs> what a great introduction to a sermon. So Peter says, these men are not drunk as you suppose. Let me explain to you what, what this is going on. And then he preaches from Joel, an Old Testament passage in Joel. But what he does is he interprets that passage ultimately in light of who Jesus was, what he came to do, and why. He explains all of this is happening for a reason. That Joel was given to Israel, but also to us, and we have to interpret it in light of both occasions. Not only in light of what it meant for Israel in their day, but ultimately how that points forward to the purposes of God in Christ. And then he applies it, and he says, and they were cut to the heart. Great word. The Holy Spirit, they were cut to the heart. Brothers, what shall we do? And he says, repent and believe. What a great sermon. What a great sermon. Again, here's an apostolic example of Christocentric interpretation and communication. The Apostle Paul, Acts 13. So in Acts chapter 2, we have Peter following his rabbi Jesus in his, this model of interpreting and preaching scripture. In Acts chapter 13, verses 16 to 41, the Apostle Paul does the exact same thing. As was Paul's custom when he went from city to city uh, to preach and to teach, he went into the synagogues. He was often accorded that honor as a former Jewish rabbi, he would often be invited to come as a traveling rabbi to preach in the synagogue. And again, what he did, though, was shocking to these Jewish believers. He preaches from several passages in the Old Testament. Again, if you have some time, take a look at that. In Acts chapter 13, verses 16 to 41, in the synagogue in Pisidian Antioch, he quotes several passages of the Old Testament, tells them what it meant not only in its original context, to the original hearers, but then he adds another layer on top of that. And he says, this also means something for you because of Jesus. And so every time we go to the Old Testament, we are called upon not only to interpret it in light of its original audience and the original author's intent, but also to add another layer of meaning and interpretation, namely, how is Jesus seen in this I'm not saying it's easy. George is going to teach us all how to do that later. So I just tell you, we, you, you must do this. I don't know how to do it. So George is going to teach you how to do it. I'm just, I'm just here to tell you that you should do it. So both, both Peter and Paul understood and were convinced that for them as preachers of, of, of God's word, whether it's the Old Testament or the New, they had a duty because of Jesus himself doing it. And so preaching Christ, why preach Christ from all the scriptures? Because one, it's biblical, all right? Secondly, we also preach Christ from all the scriptures because it's foundational. The second reason we should preach Christ from all the scriptures is because it is foundational to our understanding of the entire biblical story. It's foundational for understanding the whole Bible and not just the parts. Simply put, the Bible as a whole makes no sense without Jesus. As we have seen, Jesus and his apostles understood this overarching paradigm or perspective 
that the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus was the key to unlocking what the Apostle called the mystery of the Bible. The Apostle Paul writes about the mystery of the Bible, the mystery of the Gospel, the mystery. What is that mystery? See, the Apostle Paul knew that the Bible had one central overarching story. And though it's filled with many small stories, poems, laws, taken over various centuries in various places, still had one big narrative. And for, for many of us who, are, who love stories, this should resonate with you. I'm a huge fan of the Harry Potter novels. I'm not sure if that's a smart thing to say out loud or in, in recording, but I love the Harry Potter stories. And as you know, each one of the Harry Potter stories, for those of you who have read it, have a unique story within it, right? And a problem. The good narratives have a problem or a conflict that emerges. Bad guy comes. Good guy saves the day and everybody's happy. That's essentially a good story. But as you know, in each of those seven books, there's an overarching story too, isn't there? And so you have to know the big story to understand even the small stories. See, this is what I mean by it when I say that the Bible is found, that you preach Christ from all the scriptures because it's foundational. You need to understand the large overarching story of God the author, of God the actor, sending Jesus into time, space, and history to save a people for himself. Whether the people are from Israel, from America, or even from Korea. God has this plan and purpose to save from the mass of sinful humanity a new humanity for himself. And he accomplishes it in one person. That's Jesus. So the Old Testament saints, they looked forward to the promise of the Messiah. Us, in the 21st century, we look back to what Jesus has already done. See, so the cross becomes the center. All the Old Testament looked, looked to the cross Look to Jesus, and then after Jesus' cross and resurrection, everything else flows. The whole Bible makes no sense without understanding Christ being foundational to the central story from beginning to end. And so essentially what I'm arguing is that the Bible is one historical redemptive story, or redemptive historical story. It's a story of salvation taking place within history. So central controlling message, specific evangelistic purpose, told over time and space. So it's a salvific, historic presentation. The Bible teaches us that God, as a divine author of the entire scripture, was involved in this process through his spirit, supernaturally inspiring all the human authors to communicate his purposes for creation, fall, redemption, and consummation. And though written by many human authors, spanning time, geography, and culture, we know that from 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, that all scripture is breathed out by God, and as such is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So if you believe that all scripture is inspired by God, and he's the primary author with the primary message, then we preach, we read scripture, interpret scripture, preach and teach scripture in light of Christ. The story of the Bible authored by God then is not just some sort of nationalistic epic describing the successes and failures of one Middle Eastern people. Rather, it's a grand narrative that has repercussions for all humanity. Only Jesus, his eternal presence, prophetic promise, virgin birth, sinless life, atoning death, vindicating resurrection, and glorious ascension resolves all the redemptive themes in the Bible. So knowing Jesus is the only way to make sense of the entire Bible story. Listen to this quote from Ed Clowney. He said, there are great stories in the Bible, but it is possible to know singular Bible stories yet miss the Bible story. The Bible has a storyline. It traces an unfolding drama. The story follows the history of Israel, but it does not begin there, nor does it contain what you would expect in a national history. The story of the Bible is real history, wrought in the lives of hundreds and thousands of human beings. In a world where death reigned, they endured, trusting the faithfulness of God's promise. 
If we forget the storyline of the Old Testament, we will also miss the witness of their faith. That omission cuts the heart out of the Bible. Sunday school stories are then told as tamer versions of the Sunday comics where Samson substitutes for Superman. David's meeting with Goliath then dissolves into an ancient Hebrew version of Jack the Giant Killer. No, David is not a brave little boy who isn't afraid of the big bad giant. He is the Lord's anointed. God chose David as a king after his own heart in order to prepare the way for David's great son, our deliverer and our champion. Thus, every part of the Bible points to Christ. We know from passages in the New Testament that Jesus fulfills the prophets, 1 Peter 1. Jesus fulfills all the ceremonial laws, Hebrews chapter 10. Jesus fulfills the moral law, Matthew chapter 3. Jesus fulfills all the major characters in history, Adam, 1 Corinthians 15, Moses, Hebrew 3. And Jesus even fulfills the corporate history of Israel, Galatians chapter 3. And so this foundational way of understanding the unity of the Bible was ultimately established by the apostles in the New Testament. They saw that the whole Bible had this foundational purpose and message. So having seen now that the two reasons why we read scripture and preach scripture in light of Christ is because it's biblical foundational, let me turn to my last point that preaching Christ is ultimately practical. That's a third reason why we interpret Christ and preach Christ and uh, preach Christ from all the scriptures. Not only because it's biblical, not only because it's foundational, but also because it's practical. Are you staying with me? Are you, are you, are you all okay? Okay, good. I'm almost done, I promise. Practical. The last, we sh last reason we should preach Christ from all the scriptures is because it is eminently practical. This is because we cannot become a Christian or grow as a Christian without Jesus. I know that may be shocking to you. But think about the implica implications of that. You cannot become a Christian or grow as a Christian without Jesus. The Bible announces the good news that Christ has done something in space, time, and history that actually changes lives. That is, something has transpired that has transformational effects. Something has transpired in history that transforms people's lives. This is the gospel, the good news, the announcement that something good has happened that changes lives. Interestingly, the New Testament authors in describing this message and purpose could have chosen from a variety of Greek words that were available to them at their time. In describing this newfound religion called Christianity, they could have used words like illumination, which was available to them. Photismos was the Greek word. They could have used the word illumination to describe this message of Jesus, but they didn't. They could have used the word knowledge or gnosis. These were the words available to them, but there were other words available to them, uh, not only in, in, um, from uh, Greek, but also from a Jewish understanding. They could have used the word instruction or teaching, didache, or even wisdom, sophia. And while many of the New Testament authors utilize these words as aspects of the gospel, the New Testament writers decided on the word euangelion, where we get the word evangelistic or evangel, evangelism, euangelion. They chose the word euangelion to describe Christianity, to describe what that word means, euangelion, the good news, the gospel. With the use of this unique word, the Christian message was not only distinguishable from all other religions, but it ultimately revealed its practical nature. Remember, we preach Christ because it's practical. The practical nature, while all of these words that I mentioned before from prevailing Hellenistic and Jewish religions were used to describe some aspects of Christianity, none of them achieved the centrality and importance of the word gospel, good news. Why? First, because euangelion, the Bible presents this, the gospel or euangelion as good news of what God has already done for you. Euangelion represents something that God has already done, past, 
Every other religion talks about what you must do to reach God. The gospel says God has come and done something for you. This is what separates, practically, Christianity from every other major world religion. Christianity and the gospel is the only religion that says God has come in the flesh, lived the life you did not live, perfectly, died the death you deserve, and yet rose from the dead to give you forgiveness and the promise of eternal life. And so first of all, preaching Christ from all the scriptures is eminently practical because the good news, this word euangelion means God has done something. But secondly, it also talks about its public nature or transformative properties. Not only is good news or the gospel mean something God has already done, but it has this public character. It identifies the Christian faith as news that has significance for all people, indeed for the whole world, and it is not just some sort of esoteric insight or knowledge, or even a list of do's and don'ts, although that's important. We'll talk about the law. But centrally, primarily, the gospel is about something that has occurred Jesus' life, death, and resurrection that will forever change your life. And so early Christian preachers were called heralds of the king. If you've ever seen the movie 300, okay, I wouldn't recommend it for everybody, but in the early scenes of the movie 300, a herald from the king of Persia comes to I've already, the Spartans, right? He comes to the Spartans to provide a message. What's very interesting in the first century times, heralds were accorded the honor, the authority, and the protection of the king that they represented. Essentially, when a herald would come, you can't touch him no matter what he says or does, because he has the full power and protection of the king that he represents. So that's why in, in 300, when you know, he gives him the little boot, and the messenger goes down, that's, that's basically saying, well, we'd rather go to war than listen to this messenger. Early Christian preachers were called heralds because they were sent by the king of kings to proclaim a message that was not their own. And oftentimes, heralds in the first century, we read in the first century texts, were often sent to foreign countries, to foreign enemies, to declare what? Terms of peace. So heralds of the king, or preachers of the king, were called to go into hostile foreign territories like Sparta and saying, if you follow our king, you will have peace and not death. Think of the implications of that as preachers even. As preachers, when I get up to the pulpit and preach, I represent Jesus. It's not my message. And so I have to do my best to proclaim what Jesus wants to say to his people. What God wants to be declared to his people, which are terms of peace. Another central thing that, that heralds did during the first century, not only did they offer terms of peace to enemies, but they also made announcements of a new king. So they would say, a new king has come. And they would give news of a new coronation. A new king has come, and with this new king, we have a new era of blessing and happiness and joy and peace. So preachers of the word of God are these heralds of the king, these messengers. And you see how this message is about something that the king has done in offering peace and joy that will forever change your life if you follow him. See, so preaching Christ from the gospel is eminently practical. The, 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 the New Testament writers use the word gospel to make that case. And why is this so important? I think it's important because for many believers, they think that the gospel is necessary only for two times of their life. They think that the gospel is absolutely necessary at the very beginning of their Christian life, right? Right? And all of us would agree, you need to understand the gospel, to believe in the gospel, that is the announcement of what Jesus has done, to become a Christian, to become a follower of Jesus, you need to believe in the gospel. And so you go through that first portal, that first door. You need, you need the gospel for that first door to become a Christian. Then now that you become a Christian, what do you need? Pastor, give me seven rules for holy living as a husband. Give me 20 
steps to become a more godly father. Nothing wrong with that. And those are things we should teach and preach. So they don't think they need the gospel anymore. Well, I'm already a believer, so I don't need the gospel. I don't need to be told the gospel. I don't need to believe in the gospel. Except the second door of life. That is right when you're about to die. Right before you're about to die and enter into that new portal, a second portal of life, you just need to be reminded, wait, do I have the assurance that I'm going to be in heaven? That Jesus is going to receive me into his kingdom? Someone, please, please teach me the gospel again. Let me believe in the gospel again. So for many Christians, well-intentioned Christians, they think they need the gospel for those two portals of life. The first portal to become a Christian and the last portal when you enter into glory. But what, what about the in-between? What about in between those two portals? You need the gospel, friends. Not only do you need the gospel to become a Christian, you need the gospel every day to grow as a Christian. You see, Jesus, once you become united to Jesus in his life, death, and resurrection, this union with Christ changes everything. And so our justification in Christ, that is, our right standing before God, this once-for-all declarative act of God saying, you are now justified. Though you are sinful, you are simultaneously righteous in my sight because now Jesus has covered over you with his righteousness. Your justification is in Christ, but also your sanctification, that is your everyday renewing holiness, growing and renewing in Christ through the power of his spirit. Sanctification, growing in, your, in his spirit. That's also, but guess what? In Christ. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 1 uses this small little preposition in about 20 times to talk about the importance of what it means to be united in Christ. In Christ you are justified. In Christ you are sanctified. And in Christ you will enter into glory. You will be glorified. It's all in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. So you see, not only do you need the gospel for the portals of life, but you need the gospel for the power within life. See, God, the gospel is eminently practical for both the portals as well as for the power in between. So this is why we preach Christ from all the scriptures. Because you cannot become a Christian or grow as a Christian without Jesus. And so every Sunday, it is my task when I preach. When I do preach every Sunday, I don't do it anymore. But when I do preach, it is my privilege, responsibility, and in fact, calling lest the king kill me. <laughs> the king has given me this task of presenting his central message with a specific purpose. That Jesus has come. And if you believe in his name, you will have life eternal. Friends, I need to hear that every day of my life. Because I don't know if you're like me, but I'm a rotten sinner. And life is hard. So every day I remind myself not only of, that I'm a worse sinner than I even imagined, and yet I'm more loved and valued and accepted than I ever dare hope in the gospel, in Jesus. So I have to keep repenting of my sin and believing in Jesus, not just to become a Christian, but to grow in my Christ-likeness. So these are the three reasons why I uh, preach Christ from all the scriptures, because it's biblical, it's foundational, and it's practical. So now what I want to do is now stop so you can have at me if you have any questions, complaints, etc. But that's essentially my three reasons. And we can talk about this more as we go on, but thank you. Any questions? Sure. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll probably explain this more, and George is going to actually talk about how to structure Christ-centered sermons from the various parts of Scripture. But let me, let me offer my initial thoughts of that. First of all, my, my, my philosophy or theology or conviction about preaching is what I would call expository 
Christ-centered preaching. Meaning our, our, our job is to expose it or to dig out from Scripture and reveal it based on what Scripture actually says. And so rather than choosing, let's say, five verses on the topic of, let's say, suffering, what I'll do is I'll pick one primary text, and the primary text may be about the topic of suffering. But my job is to try to understand that text at first. The first layer of understanding that text is who was the writer? Who was he writing to? Let's say, for example, it was the Gospel of Mark. So Mark, as the Gospel writer, records for us this story about, let's say, suffering, this, this paralytic. You know the story in Mark chapter 2. Wonderful story in Mark chapter 2 where there's a paralyzed man and he's carried by four of his friends. They go on top of the roof. They dig a hole. It's a crazy story if you think about it. They actually dig a hole, lower, lower the paralyzed man. You know the story, right? Jesus sees him, has compassion on him, and does something crazy. He actually says, he doesn't heal him right away, which is what everybody in the room expected. Now think about this. A hole is dug in this roof and this paralyzed man is lowered. What's going to happen? Ah, Jesus has been healing people up to this point. But he says, son, your sins are forgiven. Uh, the disciples are like, Jesus, that's not why he's here. <laughs> that's really nice. I'm glad you want to forgive his sins. But he actually wants to be healed. He's paralyzed. <laughs> so imagine the, uh, the apostle Peter saying things like that. Going, Did you not get in the memo? And so those are the details that I have the responsibility to think about. So Mark records this story for us, this miracle story, and I have to figure out why does Mark include this story in his gospel? And while he records the story, he gives all these details. I'll talk a little bit more about this in my next lecture when I talk about Old Testament narrative. But essentially what I have to do is I have to study that text in light of its original author, the original human author, and what he intended for the original human audience there, the first century. So that's my first job is to interpret that. And I'll, I can talk about what I do to do that. But then my second job in interpretation is that, because there's, there's the human author and the human audience, original audience, but then there's also the divine author. There's a larger author, that is God himself, that has purposes of this story in light of, what I would say, the gospel, in light of Jesus. So what does this paralyzed man, this story of the paralyzed man, teach me about Jesus? And what I think it does is I think Mark is teaching us when Jesus says your sins are forgiven first before healing, but ultimately heals him, is he saying that, yes, I have come to heal the physical body, but there's something more that I'm going to do shortly. I'm going to go to the cross and provide true healing, inner healing, because healing has to come from the inside out. And so you're all paralyzed. All of you are paralyzed because of sin in your hearts. And the only way you can get rid of the paralysis of sin in your heart that this external paralysis of the body represents is for me, ultimately, to become paralyzed on the cross for you. So Jesus pays the penalty of our sin on the cross. And so then, we now have the power to live new lives so that we can have the faith, like these friends, to take our friends to Jesus' feet. And so part of our task, our missionary task, is to take our friends in need who are paralyzed by sin to the feet of Jesus so Jesus can heal them from the inside out. So this is a very missionary text. If you look at, look, look at the nature of faith, taking our friends to Jesus, but what ultimately will motivate us and change us to do that? Because we can't do it in our own power. I try and I try every day to be more like Jesus. And by myself, I cannot do it. But in and through the gospel, since Jesus has become the paralyzed man for me on the cross, and now he empowers me through his spirit, his resurrection spirit, now I look among my community and say, who needs Jesus? There are so many paralyzed people in my community, physically and spiritually, that need to go to Jesus and hear the gospel. So that's just one way in which I'm trying to uh, take into account both the, the, the original author's intention, but also the divine author's intention ultimately in light of Christ, and then apply it in a way that's faithful to the text, but also faithful to the Christ, but also transformative for God's people. So I'm trying to balance all that. It's not easy. It's not easy, but I'm, I'm going to devote my whole life to try to figure it out. Yeah. Yes, Mike. 
Yeah, that's tough because just Old Testament narrative genre is, is so, such a big topic as it is. If we have time, I could talk about poetry, apocalyptic literature as well, but I'm going to try to focus more on just narratives, largely because that's the largest type of literature in the Bible, is story. Uh, so I, I want to at least start there. Because I think a lot of people, when they're reading the stories of the Bible, I think they, fall, they, they trip and fall in, in their effort to preach Christ. Because oftentimes, stories are, are, are themselves so dynamic and wonderful. So how do you preach the story without just retelling the story and giving a moral lesson? There must be more to preaching Christ from the Old Testament. Because I don't want to sound like a Jewish rabbi. Because think about it. Jewish rabbis are preaching from the Old Testament too. They don't call it the Old Testament. They don't like it when they call it. We call it the Old Testament. They also preach from the Hebrew Bible, right? Rabbis in Jewish synagogues, even today. So they're preaching from the same stories that we read and preach, like David and Goliath. How would they preach it, and how is my preaching different from the Jewish rabbi? Because if it isn't different, that creates some problems, doesn't it? We're Christians, and it's Christian preaching, which means Christ needs to be seen, extolled, exclaimed, so that people would change. So if our, our interpretation of the Old Testament story is no different from the Jewish rabbi, then something may be wrong. So how do we then approach the Old Testament stories and do justice to the stories themselves, textually, but then also show how Christ is seen in that? And that's, you'll have to wait for the next lecture for that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. They look at the scriptures and they see Christ everywhere. Can you give us a boundary line? Obviously, we're not, I mean, the scripture's clear in 1 Corinthians 10. Sure. Christ was that rock. Sure. But we don't want Christ in every rock. That's right. So can you give us a boundary here for us? Yeah, absolutely. You actually gave us one of the boundaries. One of the boundaries that we ought to use when we, when we try to interpret Christ from the Old Testament is the actual direct or indirect allusions or references we find in the New Testament. And so he's referring to 1 Corinthians 10.4, where the Apostle Paul, talking about Old Testament passages, say, he's referring back to Exodus 17. In fact, why don't we use that as an example at the next lecture? We'll just kind of break down Exodus 17 and show how that, how that works together. But that's an easy one because the New Testament says, that rock was Christ in reference to Exodus 17. But so that's one way to, to kind of rein us in from that danger of finding Christ everywhere. But there are also other clues. For example, I said that there are two primary interpretive layers that we, that we, that we place upon the text. First is, the remember I said, the original author and his intention. That's actually one of the great parameters that keeps us from getting too far afield. And I'll explain that through the example of Exodus 17. But take, for example, that, that story. Um, let me take another example. A Genesis, since we'll do that next, next hour. Genesis 22, the story of Abraham sacrificing Isaac. When Moses records that for us, or tells us that story of Abraham having to go up on Mount Moriah, where he's told by God, sacrifice your son, but by God's grace, the, the lamb is provided in the thicket, so he sacrifices. So it's a wonderful story of testing Abraham's faith, but also ultimately God's faithfulness in providing a substitute. Some people think that, oh, okay, I've got to find Christ everywhere. Looked at that story, and they start seeing everything. Ooh, Isaac is carrying wood on his back for the fire. Mm. <laughs> Clearly, that's a reference to Jesus having to carry the cross on his back. Beautiful, beautiful. Yes, it is beautiful. What keeps us from making that, that interpretive move or that interpretive big is asking the question, was that Moses' intention when he told us that story? Probably not. Why? Because when Moses tells, Hebrew narrative works a certain way. So our study of Hebrew narrative shows us that story works within a certain structural framework. There are certain rules that apply for different types of literature. For example, when you read Green Eggs and Ham by Dr. Seuss, when you approach Dr. Seuss and Green Eggs and Ham, you read it through a certain lens, don't you? There's no such thing as green eggs, right? But you know that's a play on words or it's a figurative language 
to tell you something else. So immediately when you pick up Dr. Seuss, you don't say, I'm going to read this as I read a newspaper. See, newspaper and Dr. Seuss are two different kinds of literature, which then forces you as a reader to respect the intention of the author and what he's trying to communicate. So when Dr. Seuss wrote Green Eggs and Ham, he's basically telling you, I want you to read it based on the rules of figurative language, almost like poetry. But in Hebrew narrative, in Hebrew stories, uh, the Hebrew authors are saying, Hebrew narrative works a certain way. Read my story in light of those rules. And, and those rules are what keeps us from getting too far afield in terms of uh, uh, interpretive moves. Does that make sense? So one is direct and indirect allusions and references in the New Testament and how they interpreted the Old. But also, in the Old Testament itself, there are certain rules for the way you interpret Scripture. And we would do that ourselves, right? When we write a diary, our diary, we would want people, let's say, let's say our, our grandchildren, you pass away and they read something that you wrote, your diary or your poems, you want them to read you accurately, right? And so what, but, but what's happening now and part of the danger we're facing in our university systems today is what's called reader response hermeneutics, where the reader becomes now sovereign over the text. So no matter what J.K. Rowling intended, when you read Harry Potter, you can infuse whatever meaning you want because that's the intention of writing. I don't think so. It could be. Obviously, you can never separate the interpreter from the text, the objective text. But the objective text usually was written with an intention in mind, with an occasion, with purpose, setting, all the elements of writing is given with a certain intention. So as readers, we have to be very careful and humbly submit ourselves and say, what did the original author mean to say, and how do I interpret it correctly and accurately as possible? So those are more parameters uh, that can help us. But I'm now getting into our second lecture. So why don't we just keep going? Let me go for another two hours. No, I'm kidding. That's, uh, can I invite Mike back up to lead us in our next uh, our, our break? I think we're taking a break. Yeah.